What an incredible few weeks, powerful camp, seven conferences in seven months. Just like to thank you for your work and your service, those who helped organize the conference with our Parisian brethren as well. Amazing. I must say though, have you been a bit shocked at the weather? British summer. I was told there was a heat wave. Has anyone seen that on the news? Heat waves. No one told the British about this, did they? No one told the British. And that's made a lot of us go back to the movies and watch films. Has anyone watched Oppenheimer yet? Been to the cinema to see that? The father of the atomic bomb. Sounds uplifting, that film, doesn't it? Three and a half hours, just good news. I, I paid for my daughters, because I want to invest in them, in the wisdom. And I'm like, girls, I will, I will buy your cinema tickets to watch Oppenheimer. And they switched them and they went to watch Barbie. What's up with that? <laughs> so, like, deep, deep thriller, that one. Real deep narrative, complex. Who doesn't go to the cinema here? Raise your hand. I, 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 yeah, I, I actually paid for my, my dad, Stan, to, he used to lead the church here before to watch uh, Talladega Nights all those years ago. <laughs> And he just said to me, that film was disgusting. And he's never back, back to the cinema. All he's seen is Talladega Nights and E.T. when that was released uh, in, in the 80s. Um, anyone watching? How about Dad's Army? Come on, box sets. Just get those in if it's raining. Come on. Well, one of my favorite movies, it's not new, is The Darkest Hour. Okay, Gary Oldman playing Winston Churchill. In May 1940, the fate of the world hangs on Winston Churchill. Okay. The British are in retreat. The Wehrmacht are pushing the Allies into the sea. And there's this moment that Churchill hatches up a plan, doesn't he, with the Royal Navy. And they send over a civilian fleet to save 338,000 men. It's known as the miracle of Dunkirk. But it was also an embarrassment. It was a defeat. It was a retreat. It was a failure, if you look at it through military eyes. The pressure was on Winston Churchill to conform, to negotiate for peace, wasn't it? But Winston Churchill, he had a secret. He knew how to shape words. So on June the 4th, 1940, he enters into Parliament, the country really wanting peace. Who wanted another war after the Great War of 1914 and 1918? And he put his words to good use. He used language that was persuasive, colourful, emotive. He used words like, we will outlive this menace of tyranny, this odious apparatus of Nazi rule. His speech used repetition. Repetition adds Weight to points, doesn't it? We shall is mentioned over and over and over again. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. Here we go. We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them on the landing grounds. We should fight on the fields, on the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Who feels an inch tall already? Come on. <laughs> Winston Churchill's famous speech wins Parliament over their support to continue the fight against Hitler and defeats Lord Halifax's plan to pursue peace. In Parliament, a surprise aide to Lord Halifax asks him, what has just happened? And Halifax replied, he mobilised the English language and sent it to battle. He mobilised the English language, and sent it to battle. So our working chapter for today is called How to Mobilize Our Language for Battle. What's amazing is what linguists say. Our words do not represent the world objectively. Our words create the world subjectively. It's Martin Luther's I Have a Dream speech. It's JFK 
planning to get a man on the moon by the end of the decade with no, not much more computer power than an iPhone 5. It's God telling Joshua to be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. The phrase is repeated over and over again because he wanted him to take the promises of God for his nation. If you want to change the world, change your words. Our destiny is dictated by our diction. Our words are the difference between winning and losing. Our words create a world of hurt or a world of healing. Our words have power to bless and to curse. Proverbs says, from the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled And with the harvest of their lips, they are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Paraphrase, there's no neutral when it comes to our words. Our words produce a harvest. The quality of your life will be determined by what you speak, whether it's words of life or words of death. So here's a question as we launch this series. We're not just going to do one-off on this. I think we need a lot of practice, don't you, when it comes to speaking. Not just the extroverts, but the introverts do as well. We've got to learn to send our words out into battle, to mobilize them, because there's power in them. So a question, how have you mobilized your words this week, this month, and this year? Did someone cut you up in traffic on the way here? How did you mobilize your words? (laughs) Do you gravitate to environments that speak life or to environments that speak death? Why is this uh, series uh, important? I feel God's really taken us on a journey this last year. He's put new building blocks in our lives in order to bless us. And I feel God's taken us from an imposter syndrome that some of us walk with to having a spirit of ambassadorship. God has built our lives up in such a way where he's taken us from victimhood and reminding us that we are a royal priesthood. Every once in a while, maybe even over the last six months, that victim spirit like a vortex wants to pull you back into who you are, who you were, who you knew, and you have to battle, don't you? But you are a royal priesthood. And I was praying just a month ago, and I really felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Matt, you have a deep devotional life, but you have a poor confessional life. And some of us have got deep devotional lives at 6 a.m. in the morning. But by the time it's 6 p.m. in the evening, we have crushed all the fruit that God had given us at 6 a.m., in the morning, because there's power in our confession. Words mobilize us toward divine purposes. Do you know that? Before there was original sin, there was original blessing. The first words spoken over human beings were the word to be blessed, the blessing. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them both male and female, He created them, and then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase in number. In other words, flourish. This is amazing. When we're speaking blessing, we are most like God. When we are harmonizing our body, our soul, and our spirit, young people, our gift sets, we are harmonizing our beings with heaven. When we speak blessing, we are uploading our character to image God, and we are downloading heaven's treasure for our generation. It's amazing, isn't it? The power of words. What happened just last week? We gathered all these young people, hundreds from the area, 
youth who are, who are child carers. In other words, they're caring for their parents already as teenagers who are got disabilities. We had evacuees from the Ukraine. It's crazy to think, isn't it? We've got children in our church whose dads are on the front line and mums. But we gathered, we served. We put marquees up, took them down. The youth workers got thrown through there 80 miles an hour. They ran through gunge tanks in the name of Jesus. Who made the gunge this year, by the way? Who did that? I heard it was extra special, the guns this year. It made our guest speaker puke. How good was that? Reach. And he still managed to preach two great sermons, right? <laughs> Anyone? Put your hand up. I think no, no one wants to admit about the guns this year. But even my middle class son, Jeremy, came home. It's like, the guns this year, Dad, was over the top. Over the top. <laughs> they, put, they put hot dogs in it. It was disgusting. So should we give an applause to the guns team? Thank you for what you're doing, guys. Thank you, guns team. Everything matters to God. The gunge. <laughs> Why do we gather these young people? And, and churches up and down the country are gathering. Youth at summer camp, the big church festival. Because we believe that God wants to bless them. We're most like our Father in heaven when we are declaring out blessing over a generation. It may be true that one in four had no dad around. It may be true that the level of anxiety has gone through the roof. It may be true, and it is true, that some of their fathers are in real wars. But it is also true that God has a new narrative. He has a narrative for the church to declare, a narrative of blessing for the world around us, from those who are close and in church and those who are distant and don't even know they should be called out by God, but we're making a statement, a huge banner over one church saying, we're going to bless you. Yeah. Doesn't it feel good when we know and use our language and our activity, even a gunge tank, <laughs> to bless a people? In Hebrew, the word for blessing is baruch, which means accomplished and successful through a continued, obedient, divine relationship. It includes a concept of fruitfulness and can mean material blessing, growing in abundance, physically, socially, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Caveat, says Christopher Wright, blessing is not mechanical. Blessing is set in the boundaries of divine relationship with God and is to be declared and shared with one another. That's why Deuteronomy 30 comes to the climax with this powerful appeal to choose life. We get to choose life and we get to speak blessing. When we speak blessing, we mobilize our lives towards God's purposes. James likens the tongue to a rudder on a ship to take us to a destination. So let's do a deep dive on faith right now. Where is the word of faith that we speak out? Well, Romans says it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the faith that we proclaim. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Where is your faith? In your mouth and in your heart. How do we get faith? Faith comes by hearing how does it come? By hearing and hearing the words of God. What is faith? Now, faith, it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtained a good testimony. We have this sight because the elders that went before us, Frank, he's 80 today. Love you, Frank. Obtained a good testimony. Let's give him an applause. Come on. They obtained a good testimony. Stan and Avril and Paul and all those. Graham. Aren't you glad the elders obtained a good testimony? Aren't you glad Noah didn't say, I'm just not into boats at the moment. Aren't you glad that David never said, I just don't do giants. You know what I mean? That's not my bag, baby. Aren't you glad Nehemiah said, I'm not into building. No, because they obtained a testimony. If you imagine a bridge, we declare it through our mouth 
and through our heart. Faith comes by hearing. So if I'm on your left side here, I'm hearing God. I'm seeking God. I'm in prayer looking for the will of God. And the way you go from hearing to the substance is through the creative process of speaking out the word of God, which is in your mouth and in your heart. And then you arrive at the substance and it becomes tangible. Now, there are extremes, aren't there? You have the realists who have no faith in God. I I call it the Thomas Jefferson approach. Thomas Jefferson, the great American patriarch, fourth uh, author of the Declaration of Independence, third president, a revolutionary leader, a genius, horticulturalist, scientist, believed in freedom of religion, a defender of the faith. He said, quote, the Bible is the most sublime and benevolent code of morals which has ever been written and known to man. What a compliment from such a genius. But he was also a child of the Enlightenment. He only believed in what you could see logically and rationally. Now, for us as Christians, that's difficult because we believe that God is super rational and super logical. So one day, two to three nights, he took the word of God, the Bible, and a pair of scissors, and he cut out all the supernatural elements of the word of God, starting with the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus, cut those out, Lazarus coming back to life, chop that one out, the resurrection Cut that out. And maybe you say, how could someone say or do such a thing? How could such a genius do that? Because when we only walk from our reason and not by faith, we start to create God into our image. Not in his image. And when we do that, We kind of become like Christian atheists. We attend church, sing songs, sing songs, hear a pep talk, go home, grab a frappuccino, go home. A.W. Tozer said, if we create God in our own image, there is a God who can never surprise us, never astonish us, never overwhelm us, and never transcend us. I need transcending, do you? It's under my behavior. The other extreme is the hyper-spirituality, right? The prosperity gospel, the consumer gospel, and Jesus is treated as a vending machine. If you say it with enough gusto gusto and power, you clench your buttocks and say, in the name of Jesus, may there be a lovely red Ferrari right in front of me right now. Oh, it's not happened. Okay, it's not happened. We don't have that level of creative power, do we? But the goal of this series is to align our words with the word of God. Not pick and mix, cut out the bits we don't like. It's to align our words with the word of God, not to align the word of God with our thoughts and speaking. And that's where the power is. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. Our words, how are you doing? Are you okay? I said that was perfect timing. Bless you. She'll raise her hands towards that corner. Don't be, don't be afraid of not receiving healing right now. Have you been camping for a couple of weeks in the cold and the rain? I know how it rolls. Blessed are you, Dan and Amy and those in that crew. Men of faith. <laughs> Number two, our words mobilize life and death in all our relationships. Take a deep breath. With our mouths, James says. It's interesting that James, Jesus' brother, chose to write the biggest dissertation on words. He could have picked any subject. This is Jesus' brother. I mean, this is incredible. What does he do? He chooses words for pastoral wisdom. With our mouths, we bless our Lord and Father. Baruch, Atai, and I, we spoke about that. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Harvard Business uh, Review did a study some time ago And they tracked the amount of positive words spoken to the amount of negative words spoken. They were looking for ratios so they could work out how we could be more productive, not necessarily so that we could love each other more. And they tracked the top 5% of marriages, the top teams, and the most flourishing children. 
And they came to the conclusion that in the best marriages, five positive words are spoken out to every one negative word. In fact, they could tell you with 94% accuracy whether a marriage would last purely on the words that are spoken out in that marriage. Young people, learn to speak positive words for when you get married. For Tiffany and Honey, that's in about 30 years' time, so brilliant. Um, (laughs) They then tracked the best teams, the best teams, sports teams, the best church teams, teams in business, and guess what they found? that five positive words were spoken to every one negative word in the great teams. Then they looked at children that were flourishing and growing, and they found out that five affirming words were spoken over them to one negative. I think that's a correlation of some kind, right? (laughs) But here's what's heartbreaking. That's just the 5%. That's the top tier For the rest of the 95%, five negative words are spoken out to every one positive word of affirmation. We've got to learn this stuff, haven't we? Uh, You know, Vivi and myself came from kind of quite non-verbal affirming type uh, of families. You know, we've had to learn it. And, you know, we think, don't we, when we get married, I don't know, maybe you didn't think this, but... Did you have this sneaky feeling? Oh, this honeymoon's amazing. Unicorns and rainbows and Blue Lagoon, amazing. But did you have this underlying thought? They're almost perfect, but I could change them. Did you ever think that? Anyone? Hands up. Was it just Vivi who thought that about me? (laughs) I can can change them. Have you noticed that there are over 100 commands in, in the New Testament? And that's why you have to be part of a community, by the way. You can't not go to church and follow Jesus because you've got to fulfill these 100 commands. Love one another. Cherish one another. Speak words of affirmation. Put encouragement into one another. Put courage into someone. Forgive one another. All the one another's. There's 100 one another's in the New Testament. We were never commanded by Jesus to change one another. We were commanded... By this, the whole world will know that you are my disciples because you worked hard to change one another. (laughs) No, you loved one another. You can't change one another. I've been married for 25 years in October. And you know what? We've come to the conclusion we can't change one another. (laughs) But we can love one another. And... uh, In the Bible, as you know, there's three types of love. There's eros, where we get erotic love. Okay, love island love, that's not real love. There's phileo love, where we get friendship and family love. But the the love that the, the New Testament talks about is the unconditional love of God. It's the agape love of God, isn't it? And the agape love of God isn't there to change you. It's there to lay itself down. It's the unconditional love of God which works towards your well-being and my well-being, no matter how we respond. Wow. That's how you change, through love. So we had to learn, Vivian and I, to speak words of affirmation to one another over the years. I mean, I'm English, okay, the Brits, we're famous for our understatements, sarcasm, cynicism, so Didier, you've heard me say this before when he came to the service here, he's from France. He's like, Matt, that was an amazing service. And my response to him in the car was, yeah, it wasn't that bad, was it? And, and he, he looked at me, he's like, what is this not too bad? <laughs> I said, well, it's, we're not brilliant, we're not amazing, we're not total rubbish either, but we're just not that bad. It's kind of, he just looked at me and was like, je te comprends pas. He's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. False humility, really, isn't it? Great report. Well, it's better than being thrown under the bus, isn't it? (laughs) English responses. Oh, we we just don't stop, do we? (laughs) Throwing understatements out, being cynical. And And then the Englishman marries the Latino lady, Vivi. And they're famous for loading phrases. Okay, so a Western mum would be like, look, Charlie, you've been naughty this week. 
go and sit on the naughty step. In the Latin world, if your kid is naughty, she says, I will kill you, okay? <laughs> but she doesn't literally mean that, like it's, but you know, Charlie, don't answer back to me. Latino world, Charlie, I will wring your neck. <laughs> She doesn't mean it, but it's just how it comes out. So understatements, overstatements. And on top of that, my nan's from the East End, right, from Canning Town. So it's overstatements, understatements, cynicism, and a PhD in swearing to go with it all. We can outfight anyone just by shouting louder and swearing more. Obviously, I've never sworn in my life, as you know. Um, I love some of your families because you never swear. You're amazing. I'm like, these guys are so pure in heart. I'm always amazed by that, but... Got to be honest, like, my brothers and I, especially Sam, not Joe so much, but, man, we swore a lot. And, and listen up to, you'll love this one. We used to swear in our sleep. <laughs> and my mum would have to come in the room and tell us off, wake up, wake up, Valfine, because we'd be swearing in our sleep. But God is working on us, and this isn't like the last five years, by the way, since I've been pastoring the church, but uh, maybe last night. <laughs> We're so different. We don't can't change each other. Different temperaments, cultures, political views. But we can love one another. And we gather together. Nonverbal meets verbal. So we've had to learn over the, the years, haven't we, to put together some small phrases that have a big impact in our lives. Small phrases in marriage, are you ready young people? Small phrases in marriage have big impact, don't they? So the first one starts with S and finishes with re. I'm, no one can even say it in this church. Well, we've got some work to do. I'm, I can't say it. Celery, that's what you were trying to get at. Yes, yeah, celery. And it starts with a C. I'm, Serendipity. Oh, no, I can't say it. Yeah. I'm sorry. After three, say to the person next to you. One, two, three. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you've got to say to people you're sorry. It's hard, I know, but we're, I feel like we've taken ground. We've, t- we've, made, we've made ground today. How about another one? This is another one that can really work. Honestly, it's heartbreaking. We're on a men's conference, and a guy of 80 years old comes up to me and says, my dad has never once told me he loves me. We've got to send our, our words to battle by telling our wife, your spouse, I love you. Tell your children every single day, I love you. You might not have had that pronounced over your life, but you can change the narrative. You can send your words to battle, I love you. Should we say that? I think we should, because you know what? There might be someone in the room, young people, that you fancy. This is the moment to play musical chairs. Uh, uh, like, it's just, and it's dark. Can you turn the lights up so we can have a good view? Uh, so that could be problematic or great, a great opportunity. Uh, maybe you're sitting next to an 18 stone rugby player and you're a bloke. This is a bad time to say I love you to someone. They'll probably punch you straight in the face, uh, but we'll work on forgiveness next week. After three, one, two, three. Oh, I love you. Man, my heart is melting. My heart is melting. I love you, darling. You're wonderful. I love you, Elliot. I love you. How powerful is that? Here's another one. I actually can't find it in my notes. So I could make up something. (laughs) I was wrong, please forgive me. I know marriages in this church who have never said, I was wrong, please forgive me, it's a fact. And some husband and wife will slate each other in front of Vivi and myself sometimes, and it's shocking, to be honest with you. I was wrong, please forgive me. Powerful words spiritually, And it's a powerful word that's going to make your marriage last. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Say the person next to you. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I was wrong. 
Please forgive me. I feel like I've just sorted out a dozen arguments this week in that moment. Go home, have some champagne, some foie gras. Little phrases make big differences. I've got one second left on point number three. The greatest battle we face is with the person who looks back at us in the mirror every day. Can I have an amen? amen? It's not the media. It's not fake news. It's not the last church because they didn't have, I don't know, Frappuccino with a splash of caramel in it and you got upset. The greatest battle we face is with the person who looks back at us in the mirror each day. We have to battle with the self. We have to speak the word of God over ourselves. It's the words that we allow in us that ultimately define us. It's the words that we allow in us that ultimately define us. A ship doesn't sink because it's surrounded by water. It sinks because water gets on the inside of the bow, usually because the rudder is broken. Here's a great question. Would you stay friends with people who spoke to you the way you speak about yourself? We're in a battle, aren't we? We are in a battle, and we have to take every argument captive. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Some of you have set up strongholds in your life because of your negative bias and your confession. We destroy every lofty opinion. There's a lot of lofty opinions out there. I have a rule of life which says this, everyone has an opinion and can be my teacher. That's right, isn't it? Your friend, your foe, a child keeps you humble. But not everyone has an authoritative opinion in their life. And because of that, I can guard my heart. I can be humble, but I can guard my heart. Everyone has an opinion. But it's not all an authoritative opinion. I could break my leg in a skate park on the weekend and Jim Bob's like, he has an opinion about my leg, but what do I need? I need a doctor, right? And then when I go to the doctor, I need the opinion of the expert who then is going to repair my leg. Don't just let any blogger, any person, any family member, some kid on the street, some guy at school, some girl at school, some person at college, just speak through, straight through into your heart. Guard your heart. Take lofty opinions. Captive. We destroy every lofty opinion, love that, raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We're in a battle. And sometimes we've got to stop listening to ourselves and start speaking ourselves into faith and aligning our souls with the word of God. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy and I have come that you may have life and life to the full. If you look at the, the, the narrative of David in the Psalms, he's often saying, oh my soul, oh my soul, oh my soul. Why does he keep saying, oh my soul all the time? Because he's speaking to his inner man because it's not lining up with the word of God. For God alone, oh my soul, wait in silence for my hope is from him. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I will not be shaken. He's saying, soul, put a lid on it. Shut your mouth, soul. Listen to God who is calling you. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Soul, this summer, stop striving. Stop comparing yourself to your brother, your uncle, to your work colleague. Find your rest in God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? He says it three times. Why are you cast down? Why are you cast down? And why are you in such great turmoil within me? Soul, hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation 
and my God. Context, he's battling the dark night of the soul. He's having depressive thoughts. Some commentaries say he's looking at even taking his own life. Here's a question. When you hear that inner voice saying you don't deserve it, you're an imposter, you're insignificant, you've failed, you're no good, you won't make it, you don't deserve to live. And I'm not using that or saying that lightly because I know that some people here have thought that and Vivi and myself have have both had serious bouts with depression and points through our lives. But let's just ask this question. Where is that voice coming from? May I suggest that it's coming from the pit of hell and not the kingdom of Jesus. You've got to speak to yourself. The incredible Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, and it was worth coming to church just for this quote today. He says this, the whole art in spiritual living is knowing how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand, address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say, why art thou cast down? What business do you have to be disquieted? You must turn on yourself, upbraid yourself, exhort yourself and say to yourself, put your hope in God instead of muttering in this depressed and unhappy way. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is, what God is and what God has done and then what God has pledged himself to do. Then having done all of that, end on this great note. Defy yourself. Defy other people. What's that people who said you're not going to make it? They've been proclaiming negative over your life. Defy other people. Defy the devil and the whole world and say with this man, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance and my God. The essence of this matter is to understand that this self of ours, this other man within us has got to be handled. Do not listen to him. Turn on him. Speak to him. Upbraid him. Exhort him. Encourage him. Remind him of what you know. Instead of listening placidly to him and allowing him to drag you down. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Those who love him believe it is free. You've got to speak life. Pray it. You've got to sing it. We've got to confess it. We've got to wrestle with our thoughts, bring them in line with the Word of God. We've got to choose to live unoffended. That's one of my mantras for this year, to live unoffended. That means you've got to forgive people seven times, no, 70 times seven. You've got to go on forgiving people because we're not going to let that water get in our hearts, are we? We're going to lift it up to, to God, what God's done. Listen, just to end, seven minutes over, it's in the red. One of the things that really impacted my life was when I used to watch my dad who used to lead churches and he would often go through personal challenges like every single one of us, crisis. I remember 20 years ago he was taking this church through a massive transition, a big, big one. At the same time, my mum had cancer scare and things were heavy, things were intense in the house and I remember he used to have an old acoustic guitar do you remember this one and he would sing I will bless the Lord who remembers this at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth who remembers that song my soul makes its boasts in the Lord oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt the name together his name together and I used to think that is not cool an acoustic guitar and I'm into the rave scene. Not cool. How pathetic, singing songs on a broken down guitar in the middle of a crisis. But he knew something, that his words matter. And he was aligning his life with the word of God. And he was sending his words to battle. Because the word of God is in your heart and in your Let's stand to our feet. I know some of us are going through challenges right now. For many of us, it's not the easiest of summers. 
Some of us are going, got to go to the doctors. We've got operations coming up. Some of us are battling divorce. We're going through crises and we're having to forgive 70 times seven and it's a war. It's not just a quick one minute statement. But one thing we can do, because sometimes it feels like we can't do anymore, does it? But what we can do is praise God with our mouths. We can sing out to God, can't we? This is what God has done with our mouth. And we can declare the word of God with our mouth and in our heart and send our words to battle. That's what we can do. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Isaiah says, the word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty. He will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which it has been set out. We change our future by changing how we speak. Let's start confessing. Let's raise our hands to God. Let's declare the word of God over our...